This is an interesting device. It originates from Australia where it did eventually become a commercial product. It's called a zapper and it was a cockroach killer, but it worked in a very unusual way. It is high voltage. It doesn't just kill them though. So the history behind this, uh, well, I'll show you how it works. First of all, you press a button at the side that was changed the file design. It opens up and you can see there's two metal plates. The one at the bottom with a, a small trap for bait, a yeast pellet, I believe, and then one at the top. And they're a specific height apart that allow the uh, cockroach to go in, but will only affect its antenna. So the idea, the person that designed this, they obviously went a lot, they obviously went a, a to great lengths to design it and get the you know molds manufactured for prototypes because this is all done in sort of engineering resin all painted up and it's like pretty much almost like a product ready to go and the reason he had, had taken it to this level was he was looking for funding and he tried various uh, sources of funding i'm guessing i don't know the full story behind this but i'm guessing ultimately it must have been funded because it was released and the difference is that it's got a, a different style here perhaps more manufacturing friendly that, that it would come out of the mould in one piece better. And instead of this mechanism at the back, it was just a little catch that comes up and clicks over at the front. So for safety in this, it has a couple of indicators, uh, green for power on, red for high voltage. I have tried power in here. I didn't have any luck. Uh, used current limiting. I just wanted to see an LED light up while this was open to show that it was active. Uh, when you open it, it disconnects the power. There is a tiny little micro switch in here. And when you actually press it down, it's theoretically the weight of the unit that holds it down. This is heavy, which isn't also great for manufacturing uh, and shipping costs. But I don't know if you can hear this, but I'll, I'll lift it up and you can hear it. That clicking is a little switch and it does require quite a bit of weight in the front. I mean, it's not actually quite heavy enough to actually reliably hold that down. So let me doodle out the concept I believe behind this. I find this slightly heartbreaking, this product, because when I was young, I came up with some great ideas. And you know, these companies that offer to, you know, do all their patent filing for you. They're not interested in your patent. They're not interested in your prosperity. All they want to do is uh, get the money for filing your patent for you. The patent system is very odd. Um, and a lot of people get trapped. Uh, so I'm going to draw a cockroach. I'm not very good at drawing cockroaches. A lot of people get trapped because... Uh, they have just drawn it the wrong place and it's got a little tiny head like this and it's got two huge antenna come out like that. So lots of people, they spend their life savings trying to get a product taken to market and get somebody to take it on and they're most likely to get their product ripped off. It's unfortunate but true uh, because all companies will do, they'll change a little bit and then they'll just copy it. Right, I'm going to have two big long legs at the back. I think that's it. Uh, the moral of the story is if you come up with a great idea, unless it's completely mega radical, like a perpetual motion machine that does actually work or some incredible new product that really is earth shattering. Uh, if you can do it, just make the product yourself in small volumes uh, and just try and do everything yourself. Don't get middlemen involved. So here is the cockroach, right? And if you just kill the cockroach outright, what will happen, it's quite interesting, but also slightly nauseating at the same time, something resembling the largest toy in Bad Dragon's range will come out of its back end. This is a female cockroach, I should point out. So this big, huge thing will come out, and that is the egg sac, because one of the survival instincts is that if the female cockroach gets killed, it will eject its egg sac, and in that will be the baby cockroaches. It at least gives them a chance to survive. The science behind this device was that instead of killing the cockroach and having it eject the egg sac and having lots more little mini cockroaches, it zapped the antennas, because the antennas are really important for the cockroach. They are pretty much its main sensory input device and they are used to explore in dark areas they're used to find food and just sense you know the whole environment so by zapping them and that's what this de device intended to do it would go between these plates and it would just selectively when it's little antenna if that's the cockroach it's little antenna went up to say what's that up there it'd go bzzz, and it would zap it and it would stun the antennas or, or damage them and at that point the it's pretty much it's blind, which is a bit mean. Uh, but because it was still alive, the ejection would theoretically not occur. 
that is the theory behind this device. The product did make it to the market, as I say. Um, it was uh, put out Moon, Moon Products under license to Nabinda Enterprises. I found that out. I shall put a link below to the page. There's a museum page with one of these on it. Unfortunately, it's, it kind of found its way to a museum quite quickly. Now, opening it. I know that the electronics are on the top here, but the only way to get that out appears to be to remove these screw covers. And there are two that are underneath this cover and the hinge plate does not open up fully. So this is a, a bit of an exploration. I would like to have explored this beforehand, but I didn't want to risk uh, breaking it. I don't want to break it now because it's like breaking someone's life work, so to speak. Is that solid? I'm not really sure. If that's going to come out. That does come out. It looked like it'd be inspection hatch. It is an inspection hatch. Does it reveal anything? It reveals a screw at the back. Let's take that screw out. I think that may just hold the top on. It holds the top. I don't think that's going to come off though. I'm going to have a wee peek in with a flashlight. That's not revealing. That is not revealing an awful lot. I don't think that's too important, that screw, other than just holding that trim on. The thing that's hold, stopping this from going back is the same thing that's got the button on it. So let's take this screw out here. The person, if the person who invented this sees me taking it apart, he'd be saying, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Is this going to come out? I don't see any way for that to come out. Am I going to have to pause here? Maybe this, uh, I really don't want to break this. I don't see pins, but there is a sort of pivot point here. But I don't see how to get that bit out. It's not moving. It's like that is, I'm not even sure how they got that in there. This is a complex assembly. I don't want to break the resin. I'm going to very, very gingerly prise down here. And if the person who created this is watching this, my apologies. You'll be screaming at me. I don't think this is going to come out right. Tell you what, I think I'm going to have to pause for a while because uh, it's not overly clear how this comes apart. And I really don't want to break it. Um. I can't get at those screws in the back there because they are completely hidden. Oh, this is frustrating. I really don't see what is locking this in. I'll squeeze that, but it's not going to uncatch. No, that's not going to come out either. OK, one moment, please. I'm going to have to explore this further. That was not easy to take apart. Uh, the secret was that this little device that uh, had the springy pin, the push-in pin, actually came out in different sections. Once you take that screw out, then you could also take a cap off the uh, push-button end, and you could pull the end out of the push-button and take a screw out of that. And also the bush at the other side that was held in by the screw, uh, that also came out. So uh, quite a lot of bits and now it's open once you'd actually get this twisted to the right direction the thing would hinge up enough to give you access to the screws which are covered with glued in caps and then once uh, you'd removed that the whole lot came out and uh, it reveals a much bigger circuit board than I was expecting I was expecting a very simple continuous high voltage module let's explore it a bit further is this circuit board being made specifically for this product that's a just that's huge that is such an expense, particularly from the era it comes from. It wasn't a case of just going in like online to one of the printed circuit board manufacturers and submitting your design. This also looks kind of old school. The tracks are laid with a crepe tape. It's not been done a computer style. So much work. An awful lot of work. What does it reveal? It reveals a very retro design. Is that a 555? Hold on. No, it's not. Uh, that's an LN. Hold on, let's take a wee look at this. Where's my magnifying glass here? It's an LM393N. 
Uh, that is an op amp, I think. I'd have to check that. Um, we've got a, tran a transistor here. Is that a voltage regulator? The transistor, I'm guessing, the LM317T, that's a voltage regulator. This transistor is probably switching this uh, transformer then. And this is a high voltage transformer. With uh, this outer winding probably being pulsed, maybe a capacitor discharged through it, that might even be a thyristor then. And a resistor, a one ohm resistor perhaps to limit the current for charging that. This is all speculation and guesswork. Um, and on the output, it's got a big chain of resistors, a huge chain of resistors. That will be for discharging maybe, or sensing. Does it only trigger when an antenna actually touches that? On the output, there is what looks like a voltage multiplier on the output of this. Two capacitors here and two diodes to raise the voltage up. Then we've got one connection here. And the other connection is going to the general sort of ground by the look of it. So this is the one high voltage output. That is strange that it's got the... And they are limiting the current via this. That's quite... They're limiting it a lot via this. I guess that's because they don't want the roach to just get blown apart. What they want to do is just fizz its antenna. So maybe they experimented. Maybe they generated the high voltage and then had this chain of resistors just to limit it to the correct current that it caused that damage. But the other resistors are going down over here. Maybe to detect something. Or maybe to discharge those capacitors. Um, oh, you know what? It will be to discharge it so that when you turn the unit off and you lift the lid up, it discharges the metal plate so you can't get a shock off them. Right, tell you what, I'm going to have a little explore of this circuitry, though it's very discreet. It is a single-sided board, but I get the feeling that this is probably just going to provide power to that all the time. I shall experiment. I shall be back in one moment. Okay, I have tried working out how this is supposed to be worked. I've bypassed the safety uh, by removing that switch from the circuit so that it can activate all the time. And if I power it up now, I can draw a small spark, but the high voltage doesn't stay active for a long time. And it, it seems to possibly have the facility to detect something actually uh, making contact. So I'm going to turn the light off and I'm going to turn this on and you'll see the lights activate. The red means there's high voltage. If I bring the wire close to this, you may see a spark over here. And then the high voltage cuts off. Is it? I've left it for a while, wondering, uh, watch your eyes, I'm going to bring the light back. Is it designed to come back after a while to allow the cockroach time to leave? I'm not really sure. Um, if it has been, had its tentacles zapped. I'm not really sure what the mode of operation of this is. But it does seem to just latch off. Unless it's got a safety circuit, it's detecting some sort of situation. But um, I shall uh, show you the circuit board, but I'm not going to go into too much detail in this because this is effectively someone's prototype. And I'm cautious about, you know, they've put so much time into this I, that the final product, though it was released, I'm not sure what the circuitry was, but I shall show you the basics, but I'm not going to completely reverse engineer it to component level. So let's uh, get the drawings and we can take a look. Okay, let's explore the circuit board. And I think I've worked out how this all works. So on the back of the circuit board, the most interesting bit is the high voltage end. The transform on the other side is coming through on this uh, sort of edge connected circuit board. And it's got a couple of diodes and a couple of capacitors to create a voltage multiplier. And because that's the area that the tracks, the high voltage tracks, are closest to each other, it has a conformal coating pulled over that. Presumably something like just a, a lacquer or a resin. Um, that's to prevent uh, carbon tracking when, if it sparks over, it creates a carbon trace um, and then it can actually form a conductive path. But it'll also potentially avoid just flashing over onto things like the tracks here. After it's uh, come away from that air and it's going through resistors, it's well spaced out, so it's not such an issue. There is a current limiting, there's a voltage divider here. Um, the other thing where they've noted in the back, the, the fuse holder, they've allowed two positions for variety. Uh, let's take a look at the other side. It is by far the most interesting bit. 
The other side, right, where do we start here? Let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Right. The incoming supply goes to a discrete bridge rectifier based on one amp diodes, and that goes over to a smoothing capacitor, and that must have been an AC transformer. That then provides a highish DC voltage over to this uh, voltage regulator, which is adjustable. It's got a little heat sink tapped on it, and uh, it's got a couple of divider resistors that set the uh, voltage it will regulate to. That then generates roughly about 12... 8 volts and that is then smoothed locally by this capacitor here and that powers everything it powers the MOSFET it powers the transformer the chips here everything is powered at around about 12 volts and that fuse there is not actually in part of the that circuit the fuse is connected to a battery input presumably you can plug some sort of car battery input to this to actually run it in remote locations or something I'm not really sure so well, take a look at the high voltage end first. This high voltage transformer generates a fairly high output voltage that is then boosted up by this uh, sort of capacitive multiplier. It's got two high voltage diodes and the two uh, high voltage ceramic capacitors. That high voltage then goes to the output via these three series resistors. And the point of those resistors is that instead of the uh, the cockroach just going crack pop a spark really jumping across like those insect bats these resistors limit the current to a level that it will cause it to just basically damage its antenna harsh but that's ultimately what happens now here's the interest bit there's also a voltage divider coming down here and i thought initially that it might be doing something really clever i thought it might be doing what the victor mouse trap does where when the mouse puts its uh, moist feet over the pads it switches the zapper on but I'm not sure that would work with a cockroach uh, I'm not sure how conductive cockroaches antennas are or if they'd actually come right up and touch the upper electrode however it it doesn't look like that looking at the resistor values down here the bottom end of the voltage divider is about 33k and that suggests that this is being used to set an upper voltage level there so that it doesn't arc, arc across and also just to get the right distance for, for the uh, the cockroaches, I guess. So what they're doing here, once it reaches that voltage, then this feedback then shuts this off to actually stop boosting the voltage up until it's needed again. A little bit of voltage regulation at high voltage. The transformer looks like a fairly standard transformer, but they've wound an auxiliary primary winding on it. This isn't uncommon with these transformers, these sort of TV flyback type uh, units. But normally I'd expect them to be wound. Well, any time I've used these in the past myself, I wound the windings around the core itself. But they've wound it right around the outside of the secondary. I wonder why they've done that. It's kind of interesting. If you have an idea, let me know in the comments why you think they've specifically done it there instead of there. Uh, that also has a 1 ohm ceramic resistor in it to limit the peak current. And that is switched by this MOSFET over here. The MOSFET is switched at high frequency by this chip here that was hiding under the capacitor. Initially, I just saw the op amp. I wondered how that worked. This is a, a classic chip. It's a CMOS CD40106B. And uh, they basically have six gates in them. And they're a simple inverter. If you put a logic one in, which is going up to the 12 volt rail represents one zero volt rail represents zero if you put a logic one in the output will go to zero and vice versa but the fact it's a schmidt trigger means that it's you can put a slowly rising voltage in and it'll only change state when it reaches say an upper voltage say about eight volts and then it'll only change back again once it goes down to about four volts so it means there's a sort of dead zone in the middle of that you if the voltage is ramping up or down it will stop it just sort of oscillate at high frequency Although, in this case, they do want to oscillate at high frequency. So what they've done is, with these gates, and you've got six of them in here, you can simply use a resistor and capacitor. Resistor from the output goes back to the input. The capacitor causes a slight time delay, and it, it's great. You can make timers, you can make oscillators uh, with every single one of those gates. But in this instance, the six gates, because they have a fairly low current output, because they're just logic gates, what they've done is they've commoned four of them together. 
So all the four down this side and one over on that side are all coming together so that when the output, uh, when that group of gates uh, is fed a signal from one of the other gates, it increases the current and that's going straight to the gate pin of the MOSFET. That just buffers it up, makes sure the MOSFET turns on and off decisively um, and keeps it sort of happy, ultimately. It will run cooler if it gets a really fast transition on the, the gate. Then round about here, this tiny little capacitor is associated with this divider, but there's another tiny little capacitor here, which, given the frequency of this, I'm guessing that is tied in with some of these resistors and diodes to be the pulsive, uh, pulsive modulated control for this. And if you just used a simple resistor and capacitor, it would be a, roughly a 50-50 mark space ratio, but you can nudge that with diodes so the charge is faster than discharge or vice versa. And I reckon that's what they might be doing here, um, to feed it the correct sort of waveform for most efficient operation. But there's also this other big fat capacitor, and it looks as though it's tied in to a similar arrangement here, so that uh, the high voltage, when you power it up, the high voltage comes on straight away, but then after a while it goes off, and I wondered if that was some safety thing kicking in. I don't think it is. I think it's a power saver. And also, I wondered what stopped... The cockroach is sensing the high voltage with the slight corona. You know they get that slight discharge when you go near high voltage. You can feel a slight fuzz. Their antennas would pick that up. So what I reckon is that this turns off for quite long periods of time and the cockroaches go in and they start eating the bait and then every so often it will just turn on and that's when it zaps their antennas. Uh, that way they, they don't get any warning, there's no clue, they're in there happily munching away, it zaps them and it also keeps the power consumption low. So I'm guessing that would probably be quite a long time delay. Actually I'm looking at that resistor there and thinking that is a long time delay, it's a very high volume resistor. That's about uh, 1.5 mega ohm. Yeah that is quite, that's going to result in a very long time. Hmm. But there we go. Uh, it's interesting, very interesting, and it makes me wonder what actually happened to the product. Who who designed it, and was it as much of a success as they were hoping for, or or did it not like achieve its target market? It certainly looks like the case was more optimised and designed. It looks like they simplified it um, when the thing was actually launched, which would make sense because the this is a prototype. It could all be you know fine tuned for manufacture, but very interesting. Well worth taking a look at. So that was quite enjoyable, just working out how to get into it and then trying to work out what the circuitry was actually intended to do.